have, if you have your Bibles, and hopefully you do, open to James chapter number 4 tonight. James chapter number 4. You know, sometimes life is filled with surprises. And um, boy, I, I had two today that I didn't know what was, what was a bigger surprise. Um, either one, that some people actually move seats today. Tonight, you know, I talked about that this morning. Some of you were out in ministry. We talked about moving seats. I had a few families here in different places. Kind of, you know, gives me like a nervous tick, and I see you. But probably the greater surprise is that you knew I was here and you still came back tonight. And so, well, I appreciate that. At least you humor me sometimes. Um, in James chapter 4, we're going to continue where we left off a few weeks back. And in James chapter 4, verse 1, James begins with a pretty heavy concept, a pretty heavy, um, a pretty heavy accusation. Uh, one that, as we preached on a few weeks, weeks back in July, how that if anyone were called this, they would, they would really begin to defend themselves. And he uses words that we use in marriage about adultery. He says adulterers and adulteresses in James chapter 4, verse 1. Um, ver, um, I'm sorry, verse number 4 of James chapter 4. He says, Know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God? Uh, whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And definitely the verb is chosen there and the words there is chosen to instigate a response. There are certain words that we call fighting words. Number fighting words we say. There are certain things if someone says that, that will bring a response. And I believe that's partly what James is doing here. He's trying to wake us up to, to this concept. He says, hey, listen, there's a problem here. And it's not a problem because they've chosen to reject God or have they rebelled against God or denied God. No, they've just made a friend of the world. They've just chosen to, to be a friend and, and grab the ideas and to be really involved in the society as a whole. And James says, understand that this society is in direct and complete opposition to God. We preached on that a few weeks back, and I won't repeat that message. But, but just think with me. A few years back, our, our girls went to the volleyball championship for Division Two, and we lost to a team from Skeels. Sorry, Brother Cross, to bring back that painful memory to us, okay? But just imagine if after that loss, as, I'm, as I am the coach of that team, if I said, you know what, girls, you played really well, but I'm going to go out to eat with the other team from Skills, and we're going to have a good time at supper tonight. Would that be okay? Eh, not really. I've got to be honest. No. No. First of all, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't be a happy person at that moment. But if you, your daughter played on that team, and, and you saw me eat with the other team that had just defeated us, you wouldn't think, man, you know, Brother Howell, what a good Christian tonight. Man, just reaching out to other people. Man, what, just a ministry. Look at him just involved with people. You'd say, what is he doing? We just lost him. Listen, if you're going to be nice to him, at least wait a day, wait a week. Yeah, that's what James is talking about. Let's go a step further. Let's say someone kidnaps my children. Demand a ransom. I get them back and... Once they come back, you know, they bring them back to me and I pay them a lot of money, maybe $5, some huge amount like that. And, and then I say, listen, guys, I know you kidnapped my children. I know you caused a lot of stress in my life and my wife's life. Everyone was praying. But listen, I'm hungry. You guys want to go to Buffalo Wild Wings? Get some hot wings with me? I need some advice on raising kids and dealing with people. And you guys seem like good guys. If you happen to see me at, at Buffalo Wild Wings with the, the former kidnappers of my children, you wouldn't think, wow, Pastor Al, what a nice guy really reaching out. You say, what's wrong with them? Let's go another step further. Let's say that someone, a man, were to put the moves on my wife. Would I then say to that man who would put the moves on my wife, you know, that's nice. I think she's beautiful as well. Do you want to go out for a steak dinner? <laughs> I would probably take him out somewhere, but it may not be to dinner. It may be out back where I explain why that wouldn't be a good idea. <laughs> Yet James says... Listen, friendship with the world is in, is in direct opposition to the God of the universe. The friendship with the world and, and following their plans, their solutions, their ideas is cheating on your Savior. He says, know ye not, ye adulterers, adulterers and adulteresses, that friendship with the world is enmity with God. And that's kind of where we left off. And after this, though, James does not just present a problem and leave. You know, some people are like that, are they not? Some people just like to give you a problem and have no solution for the problem. Hey, Brother Howell, did you know dot, dot, dot? And then they're happy, their job is done, they walk away. And i got to figure out a solution. And, and, you know, that's okay, you can bring me problems, but it'd be nice around the church sometimes if you also bring a solution. James brings both to us. 
He brings us some, some medicine, if, if, I, if I could, that if we let it, will transform and revolutionize our life. You know that every medicine bottle that you get comes with a few things. It comes off, first of all, with a cap that only a child can open. You know those childproof caps? That when you need it, you just can't get the thing open, and you push it, and you twist it, and you try, but, but you give it to your four-year-old, they'll have it off in a second. It also comes with some instructions. Does the Bible not say things like, take three pills two times daily before and after you eat? I found a few humorous medicine instructions. One said, take one tablet by mouth into right eye. Figure that out. Take one tablet by mouth into right eye. Shake well and inhale four puffs daily into each ear. And my personal favorite, every night before food, once daily to be taken four times a day, three times a day, every three times daily, take one, take two, take three, one or two. Warning, follow, follow the printed instructions you've been given with this medicine. <laughs> what am I doing? <laughs> take the bottle, spit it out, take it again. Yet I come to this passage, James chapter 4. And I see if I can go back to volleyball for a second. I see and, and I'm reminded of a cheer that happens. There's a cheer on the sidelines that goes something like this. Uh, we've got spirit. Yes, we do. We've got spirit. How about you? How the cheer is supposed to happen is the other, the other team, the other team's fans will echo back that cheer across, across the gymnasium in front, of the, in front of the players. We've got spirit. Yes, we do. We've got spirit. How about you? And then the side yells again. We've got spirit. Yes, we do. We've got spirit. How about you? And eventually, one side begins to yell this phrase, we've got more. You know, you've heard this before? Yes or no? We've got more. And, and this, this raucous takes place. We've got more. We've got more. We've got more. And in some way that we're going to convince the other side that we have more spirit by our redness of our faces and the loudness of our, of our, of our speech. And I come to James, and I think you'll see it right away because James has just set up a big problem, but he brings a big solution. And if you would, please look in verse number six tonight. We'll start there. In verse number 6, James makes this phrase, but he giveth, what are the next two words? Help me here, more grace. Can you not hear that cheer, we've got more, we've got more, but he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy into heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he shall lift you up. Tonight, if I can, entitle this message, He Gives More. He Gives More. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth here. Lord, I pray that in the next few moments you would help our hearts to be touched by your spirit through your word. Lord, help me to say the things that I ought to say. Lord, you know that I've tried to study and put the time in that would honor you with this, but all that is in vain if your spirit doesn't work in me and through me. And Lord, that would be nothing if your spirit's not here among us tonight touching and changing hearts. Lord, help us to be good listeners. Help us to respond, and would you have your word not return void tonight, but may it produce something in hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen. I see this solution this medicine that James says God gives more of. It's called grace. This word, grace. I notice a theme throughout these few verses, and the first, the first theme that I notice is humility. Submit, therefore, to God. God resisteth the proud, giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves in the sight. You see this theme in these few verses repeated three or four times. Not by accident. And so, with each point, I've labeled it with some idea of humility in it. The first point I call this a humble acceptance. A humble acceptance. He giveth more grace. We have to wonder why is God so patient with me? Why is God so patient with us? Why does He still love us? Because of His grace. Because God is a gracious God, and Exodus and the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, he's talking to Moses, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. You see, God is a gracious God. God is a giving God. 
I see, first of all, in this passage, that grace, God's grace is supplied. He giveth. So where does it come from? Help me. From God. So, so if God is giving it, what can I do to earn it? Nothing. That's why the first one is just a humble acceptance. I can just receive it. Who gives it? God, so I just have to be in the way. We think that we can earn God's grace, maybe by what we wear or what we do or how often we pray. We can't. God gives it. He giveth more grace. God gives and wants to give. No response at this point is required, just acceptance. God, the creator of the universe, desires to give something to us that will solve a very difficult problem. In fact, it's a thing that will solve any problem. But not only do I notice his grace supplied, I notice his grace is sufficient. It says, he giveth more. There's enough to go around. There's enough so it won't run out. How much do you need? Just a little bit more. How much do you want? Hopefully, just a little bit more. A few weeks back, I was going to make something in, in the kitchen, a breakfast. I make breakfast on Saturday. My wife does a phenomenal job of keeping our house decluttered. In fact, she goes through the cupboards and declutters those as well. And, and she had noticed that the baking soda, all right, was about two and a half years old. Who knew? And she's like, that must, we must not need that any longer. And so she tossed it. Or didn't. And so I went to, to, to find this, or maybe it was baking powder, one of these two cans that was, that was in the cupboard. And I couldn't find it. I said, honey, you know, where's the baking powder? Where's the baking soda? And she said, oh my goodness, I just cleaned it out and I didn't think you ever really used that, so I threw it away and I'm going to get some more this week. At that moment, look at the recipe, I'm looking at what I got to do, and I'm like, I can't make this. I don't have any. You know, in the Christian life, we never go to the cupboard for God's grace and it not be there. It's always right there. It's always ready. He giveth more grace. God's grace is sufficient. Years ago, I was a youth pastor, and I took another youth pastor out to lunch. He was uh, Pastor John Guglielmetti at, at Community Baptist. We're sitting in a Mexican restaurant. I forget the name of it. It was the one across the river. They used to make um, fried tacos or Reese tacos over there. They're well known for those Reese tacos. Somebody remembers? La Pacita. I think that was it. Yeah, so we're over there. And um, at that time, they only took cash. What restaurant only takes cash? Come on now. This is, I mean, this is crazy. Uh, but we're sitting there, and I said, hey, he had to get back and teach a class. I said, John, don't worry about it, man. I got lunch. I'm taking you out to lunch. Man, get out of here. So, you know, she, he leaves, and the lady brings the bill, and I give her my card, and she's like, oh, we don't, we don't take anything but, but cash. I'm like, I have no money. I'm one of those young people who don't carry a lot of cash on me. I think I had $25 in my pocket this morning. Now, you older people look at me like, oh, my word, how can you not carry cash? How many older people have cash on them right now? I better hold them up high and I look around. So you got to hit on the way out. <laughs> Ushers, get to, get, get, to, get to that those people right there. You know where to go. <laughs> you thought I was preaching. No, 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 no. I was setting you up for something later on. And I tell you, man, I had, I had no cash on me. I'm, I'm thinking, I said, well, can I leave my license to come back? And I'm, I'm sweating great drops of, of just whatever. And go to my car and I found like 35 cents in my car and it was like $17. It was not getting solved. And uh, what well, do you know, Greg Bays, Greg Bays was at, the, uh, was at that restaurant. He saw what was going on. And he goes, oh, Brother Howell, you know, and he's, he's letting me have it. What's going on? Oh, I don't have any money. I don't have any cash on you, do you? You know, and like a good fellow Christian. And, and he ended up paying so I could actually leave with my name intact. And I brought him money later on. But, oh, man. You know, you never go to pay the bill for a problem and God not have enough grace for you. There's more than enough. God's grace is sufficient. I remember one of my first cars was a Datsun. Pastor Scott affectionately named it the Chickmobile. <laughs> That's a story for another time. If you pay him enough money, he'll probably tell you. But there is a story there. I remember one time I'm driving down the road, the gas gauge didn't work real well, and it went to E. Now, E does not mean empty like many of you think it does. E means walk. <laughs> and that day it ran out and and there I am right by the speedway on Dixie Highway trying to push this Datsun all by myself. You ever tried to push a car by yourself? Come on, men. How many of you men have done this? Yeah, you idiots, just like myself. I can go one more mile. I'm right there. And you let the door open. You're pushing while you're steering, all right? And there's an Everly's, you know, it just, and uh, I've got it out there. And at that point, most people don't offer to help you, all right? They offer to watch you and laugh at you, all right? And they're like, oh, look at that idiot. He was so close to the gas station, all right? And they didn't make it. But you know that with God, you never run out of the, the grace of gas. You never run out. There's always more than enough. In fact, in fact, I like that gas illustration the best. Because I look at God's grace, 
I think of God's power. In fact, I brought some to church tonight. Of course I would, right? Just so you don't forget that. But I'm going to set this up here. Now it's empty, so don't be worried, all you fire marshals. It's actually a diesel can, in case you're wondering. But God's grace. And this passage equals God's power. I want you to hold your finger in James and turn over to 2 Corinthians. I want you to see this. If you would, 2 Corinthians chapter number 12. We've seen grace, and, and, and we, we want to define we want to define words, God's word from God's word. But God's grace is his strength. There's some movements out there right now called, one's called the grace movement, and, and they'll say things like, they'll say things like, listen, you know, you just need a God hug today, or you just need a grace hug from God today. What does that even mean? How do I get a grace hug from God? If it was possible, I'd take it. I just don't get it. They'll, they'll say things like, listen, with just the grace of God, you can do anything you want to in your life because God's grace is sufficient. Now, God's grace is sufficient, but it's not a license to live the way I want to live. Paul says that in Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And he answers the question, God forbid. Real plain. But other, someone else said, well, grace is God's riches at Christ's expense, G-R-A-C, and it's, and it's all right, nice. It's kind of cute, actually. I just like to look at the Bible and see what the Bible says about God's grace. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we have Paul where he's praying for help in this time of infirmity where he has this thorn in the flesh. And he prayed, the Bible tells us, three times, and God did not remove that thorn in the flesh from him. Instead, God gave this answer in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9, and he said unto me, it's God, Jesus said unto him, to Paul, my grace is sufficient for thee. He goes on to, with a parallel statement here. He says, for my, what's the next word? Strength. So my grace is sufficient for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. You see, we understand if we study the Bible that in one aspect of grace, there is Christ's strength. And I believe that is what James is bringing us to us here back in James chapter 4. I don't believe at this point he's bringing us the unmerited favor from God. I don't think James says, listen, you know, you're friends of the world, and so God just loves you and doesn't care. I don't get that from this passage from James chapter 4. I don't get the concept after James has said, ye adulterers and adulteresses, that he's trying to remind us that God doesn't care and just grace rules your life. In fact, one person who was in this grace movement said, the, the way grace works in my life, the Holy Spirit led me to stay home from a Wednesday night church service. And it was just sweet fellowship with God that Wednesday night. Now listen, you ought to have sweet fellowship with God all the time, right? But I don't think the Holy Spirit's going to lead you to stay home from church all right, so if you want to stay home, just say you want to stay home. But don't blame God's grace on the matter. Don't say, God, God told me to stay home, so I had to stay home, Pastor. Sorry, I had no option. God told me to. You know, just say, listen, I, I want to stay home. I'm, I, I'm lazy. All right, I'm tired. I want to stay home. At least we know. At least you're honest. Yet in this passage, I, I don't see that, that James is saying, oh, this grace is there to just let you live like you want. What I see is that James says, but he gives more grace. He gives you more power, so you don't have to live this way. You don't have to deal with that problem. You can be a little bit different, and that grace looks like the power you need right down there. The grace is what will energize you, that, that gas can. When I pour that into an engine, that engine now runs properly, and without it, we walk. With that, I can weed eat my yard. Without it, I'm clipping it with scissors. With it, I can run a generator for my house. Without it, I freeze in the wintertime. With it, I can do lots of things without it. Life just isn't the same. You see, God has enough grace to overcome any obstacle in my life. Enough power to overcome any obstacle in my life. But not only do I see a humble acceptance, I see a humble acknowledgement. You see, the Bible says, He giveth more grace, but wherefore He saith, in verse number six, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. 
So not only is there a humble acceptance, there's a humble acknowledgement. Get this idea, if you would please, that God is either helping us or resisting us. God is either helping me or he's resisting me. There is not a third option. There's not an option where God is just standing idly by saying, hmm, I'm going to wait. He's either helping us, giving us grace, or he is resisting us. There is not three options. As long as I say I can do it, God won't. God resists pride. As long as I say I can do it, God won't. You see, when I do it myself, I make a mess of things. I read about this account in the summer of 1986. Two ships collided in the Black Sea off the coast of Russia. Hundreds of passengers died as they were hurled into the icy waters below. News of the disaster was further darkened when an investigation revealed the cause of the accident. It wasn't technology. It wasn't a, ma- a radar malfunction or even thick fog. The cause was human stubbornness. Each captain was aware of the other ship's presence nearby. In fact, I looked it up on a different on a news site, and, and one news site said they knew for 45 minutes the other ship was there. And both could have steered clear, but according to the news report, neither captain wanted to give way to the other. And each captain was too proud to yield first. And by the time they came to their senses, and I read that in a different news article, by the time one realized what was happening, they, they threw the engine in full revor- reverse, it was way too late. I believe that the illustration of those two boats is true of our life as well. As long as I'm running this ship, I'm on a collision course for something. As long as I'm stubborn, as long as I can do it, God won't do it. You say, Brother Howell, life is tough. I just can't seem to gain victory in my life. That's because your tank is empty. And it's not because there's not enough there. It's because you won't let God put it in. It's because you won't let God help out. As long as I can do it, God won't. As long as I'm in charge, God is on the other team. As long as God, as long as I'm in charge, God is on the other team. I brought something else with me tonight. Actually, someone helped me out with this one. This is a good door. What's behind door number one? That's what this door is. I need some help. Danielle, can you help me? I'm just going to be shy. And Addison, I need Addison too. Addison, baby girl, are you too shy? You give me a hand. These two wonderful girls. Come here, y'all. Okay, I know you're going to be super nervous. I know, I know, but you girls are so beautiful, both of you. Okay, and they were born just a few days apart. They actually do two days apart, and then, all right, and girls, I need you to do me a favor, all right? Danielle, would you hold that side right there? All right, and walk that way. Walk, put, wrap it up good, okay? Addison, you come over here, okay? You, you want to go up on the second step, baby girl? One more step. Okay, don't t- pull too hard. You're too strong for daddy. All right, come this way, come this way. Come here, Addison. All right, right here. Okay. All right, there, Danielle. Hold, hold still. Come here, Addison. Okay, come up here. All right, there we go. All right, have you girls ever played tug of war before? You want to play tug of war? All right, you got a good grip now. So when I say go, you got to pull the rope really hard. Okay? You know how to do that? I'm going to move my diesel can. Okay. So when I say go, you're going to pull the rope. Ready? Now, do you want me to help you? Okay, good. Mark it, set, go. Now, you say, well, here, grab it again. <laughs> like, hey, okay, get back. Get, get tight again. There we go. There we go. All right. You want me to help you again? Okay. Are you ready? On your mark, get set, go. Hold this again. Okay, hold it again. When I say go, we do it again. Want me to help you again? No. Now think. Thank you. That's perfect. Now you girls go sit down. Thank you. Leave that rope right there. You're awesome. You sit down. You sit down. Thank you, girls. Love you, Daniel. Love you, Addison. Is this not what we do in life? God says, I'll give you grace. I'll help you. You're humble. You ask for it. I'll help you. But the minute that I put myself in charge, God is on the other team. He's pulling against me. He's resisting me. Danielle, she's my girl. I love her to death. Okay? 
But let's be honest, she's never winning this tug of war with me on this side ever. Ever. Okay, not, not, I mean, not today. I mean, maybe 40 years from now. Right, but she's not winning, right? I fall down and I can still hold on, could I not? I could close my eyes and still, I could, I could hold my left hand and pull, I could put it on my ankle and pull it, right? So, why would I try to live life with God on the other side of the rope? Pulling against me, saying, don't do that, don't go that way. When here's the other side of the offer. The offer's not, hey, watch God. The other offer is, I'll help you pull. I'll help you pull. Who would not want God on their side pulling in a game of tug of war? We've played at camp before, and sometimes you get a big guy. You watch him wrap that, that rope around his waist, right? And it says, go, and the other team's pulling. And it's like he's standing there. He's like, bring it on, little boys. You know, and he turns around and starts trugging, and starts chugging, and starts trucking. Man. So Sandy and Phil back there, I remember a long time ago, talking about Daniel, their son at camp. He was a strong young man. Steve, remember that strong young man. Tug of war, Daniel, on the end of the rope. Man, that guy could pull a tug of war rope. And of course the kids want him, and sometimes in those teams at camp, somehow they get, you know, miss, uh, they're not exactly the right way, and so you have these seventh graders versus these just huge high schoolers, and these little seventh graders looking like, oh no, what's going to happen? And high schoolers like, we've seen this before. Say go, Pastor Howell, it's time to go. Yet God says, you're proud, you do it yourself, then I'll let you pull, but I'm going to pull against you. But if you just have a humble acknowledgement, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If you say, God, help, God says yes. If I, if I say, help, God, then he comes and he grabs that rope from the other side of pulling, and he begins to pull for me. And what do we do? We're like, that's right, life's going pretty well. I've seen that in tug of war match as well. These kids pull it, and they're not doing nothing. They weigh 35 pounds. And you got some he-man, all right, on the other rope, yanking it. All right, he's doing the work. That's what God does for you and for me. He's pulling that thing. He's giving us the grace. And the humility says, all right, I can do it. Because God has grace. On a visit to the Beethoven Museum, a young student became fascinated with a piano on which Beethoven had composed some of his greatest works. She asked the guard if she could play a few bars on it, and he, she accompanied the request with a lavish tip, and the guard agreed. The girl went to the piano and tinkled out the opening of the Moonlight Sonata. As she was leaving, she said to the guard, I suppose all the great pianists who come here want to play on that piano. The guard shook his head, and he said, No, Paderewski, a famed Polish pianist, was here a few years ago, and he said... I'm not worthy to touch that piano. Can we not think sometimes that life is like a piano? Different notes being played. And it would be a good dose of humility for us as Christians to say, God, I'm not worthy to touch these keys. God, you're the master. You're the pianist. Would you play something out of my life? Would you take over? God resists the proud. You get it? But he gives grace to the humble. God says, you don't, I resist you. But if you ask for help, I'll make this thing happen. I see a humble acceptance, a humble acknowledgement, and lastly, I see a humble action. Submit to God. Everything else is secondary. You say, I don't like a list of rules. I'm not talking about rules. I'm just talking about submitting to God. Saying, God, what do you want? Sometimes our students will leave and they'll say, well, there's just rules over there. You can't wear this. You can't go here. You can't listen to that. And yes, in the school, we do have some rules, okay? You have to for an institution. But if you come to church here longer than a couple days, you know this. It's not about the rules. It's about him. And if we had Christians who just say, God, what do you want? You talk about music, and, and sometimes you have a student come and say, you know, what's wrong with this music? And I say, that's the wrong question. It's not what's wrong with it. It's, God, what, was, what is going to please you? How can I submit to you? What do you want from me? You know, why can't we wear this? No, God, what do you want me to wear? God, God, why can't we do this? No, God, what do you want me to do? You see the humble submission to God? I'm trying to do it God's way. You see, the key is to do what pleases God. I think it fits right into what he says in verse 8 when he says this, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. I love pastor's sermon. At every step you take to God, he takes one step to you as well. 
Every step you take, you're two, you're two steps closer to God. It's the same idea. I submit to God. I come close to God. But see, what I don't want to do is I do not want to waste God's grace on my life. God has offered grace. He offered in salvation. He offers it now in sanctification, way to live right. And Paul makes this profound statement in 1 Corinthians. He says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. And I, I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. End of this, these verses, it says things like, cleanse your hands, ye sinners. Purify your hearts, ye double-minded. I read that word double-minded, and it goes back to chapter 1 of James. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. To be double-minded is to have two focuses, a godly focus and something else. Where God is not excluded, he's just a part of the thing. I see it, purify your hearts, a singleness of heart toward the Lord. Cleanse your hands, make sure you live right. But it's all wrapped up in this concept, he gives more. Without grace, I can't cleanse my hands. Without grace, I can't purify my heart. Without grace, I can't have a single-minded way or direction. Without grace, I can't defeat, or I can't stop from being a friend of the world. But with grace, with God's grace that he gives freely, I can live the right way. Remember, James, throughout his book, is talking about how to be a complete Christian. And he opens up this chapter with the, the words, you're a cheater. You're nothing but a cheater. But he brings a solution that's so much broader than his accusation. The solution is, you got God's grace. You've got all the power you need. You've got every bit of it. And when you think you're about to run out, he'll fill your tank up again. When you think you're tired, it's not time to walk. He's got more. He's got more. He's got more. But just so you know, if you don't want it, he's going to pull against you. If, if, if you don't want his power, you're not going to win. If you don't want to do it his way, you've got no chance of success. You really look at it, and if I can say it this way, it's a no-brainer. I can have God's power as much as I need, God's strength as much as I need to face every situation in life, or I can have God fight against me and resist me. Hmm. Which one will I choose? Let's choose God's grace. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace, which you so freely offer. Lord, I would ask you to search our hearts. Or maybe there's one here who is trying to do things in their own strength, not realizing that your grace is the power to endure, to live, for success. Lord, maybe not even realizing that by rejecting that in their pride, they're having you resist them. But Lord, give us the grace we need to respond to you. In just a moment, the piano will play. We'll stand. Maybe you need to come back and say, Lord, I just need some more. Lord, I've been fighting you, and you've been fighting me. Lord, I want you on my side. Might be some dads who say, I need you back on my side. Or some kids who say, I need you back on my side. Some people at work. But let's let God give us a grace.